Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the topic of spiritual awakening. My guest is Steve Taylor. He is the author of Extraordinary Awakenings, The Leap, The Psychology of Spiritual Awakening, Spiritual Science, Back to Sanity, Out of the Darkness, and many other books. He's a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University in the United Kingdom and ch the chair of the Transpersonal Psychology Section of the British Psychological Society. Steve's articles and essays have been published in over 100 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers, and he also blogs for both Scientific American and Psychology Today. This interview was conducted in a hotel room in Las Vegas where Steve and I were both attending the awards ceremony of the Bigelow Institute competition. And now I'll switch over to that video. Welcome, Steve. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Great to be with you, Jeffrey. You have been looking at spiritual awakening from many different perspectives, but in particular, you're looking at the way a trauma, a traumatic event can precipitate a, a spiritual opening. I've been, I've been doing research in this area for about 15 years, and I've found that when people are in the midst of intense psychological turmoil, uh, a good example is for um, a diagnosis of cancer, a, a long period of addiction, a long period of depression, bereavement is quite a common phenomenon, uh, transformational phenomenon. Uh, but also things like uh, incarceration, uh, military combat, basically any uh, period of very intense turmoil can give rise to spiritual awakening. Why do you think that's the case? I think it's to do with the, the dissolution of the ego. When people go through intense suffering, there's a slow, well, sometimes it can be very rapid, but usually it's a slow process of uh, ego dissolution. The ego is slowly broken down. In my view, it's connected to psychological attachments which sustain the ego. So, so a good example is, um, let's say a person who is an addict, slowly over the course of their addiction, their psychological, uh, psychological attachments begin to break down. So I mean their attachment to future ambitions, to their social status, to their possessions, to their, their, their relationships. Basically, there's a slow process of dissolution. And when enough psychological attachments are dissolved away or broken down, then the ego itself dissolves away because the ego, in my view, largely consists of, of psychological attachments. So then there's, a, there's a, a breakdown of the ego. And when the ego breaks down, obviously not in every case, but in some cases, there's a space which allows a, a latent, spiritually awakened self to arise and take the place of the old ego. I would think that the initial reaction to a trauma is very often something like, why did this happen to me? Yeah, that's right. That is quite a common reaction. So I found in my research that, you know, tra transformation didn't, didn't always occur or didn't often occur right at the moment, right in the midst of trauma. There was often a period of adjustment and acknowledgement and acceptance. So transformation usually occurs in a moment of letting go, of surrender, of acceptance. A lot of people could identify one specific moment when their transformation occurred, and it was often at the moment of acceptance, when their resistance uh, dissolved away, and suddenly they embraced, either voluntarily or involuntary, involuntarily they embraced the full enormity and reality of their predicament. It sounds very similar to the stages of grief uh, outlined by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I think it is connected, yeah. Acceptance, I know acceptance is part of that process. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, it was definitely, I mean, I, I talk about the alchemy of acceptance mm -hmm. and it applies to every aspect of life, you know, actually not just 
uh, not just trauma and turmoil. Mm -hmm. And an attitude of acceptance can transform a negative event into a neutral or even a positive event. You know, w when you resist your predicament, it creates conflict, it creates duality. There's a, there's a barrier between you and the reality of your life. So when you switch into a mode of acceptance, the barrier fades away and suddenly you're at one with the reality of your life and there's a feeling of release. And, and often, as I say, that, that gives rise to transformation. In fact, one might even go so far as to say that a person whose life is always completely comfortable may be at something of a disadvantage. That's true. I mean, as human beings, I think we, we, we're, we're, we're paradoxical creatures. Everyone knows that. You know, we're very, very complex paradoxical creatures. So there's an urge inside us to cling to safety and security. Nobody wants to voluntarily face hardship and pain, so we want to make our lives as stable and secure as possible. But the problem with that is that it doesn't necessarily lead to personal growth. Personal growth often usually occurs when the stability of our lives is disrupted. Suddenly everything is thrown into disarray and suddenly we have to, we have to burrow deep inside ourselves to face the situation, to draw on resources, to cope with the situation. So we, we, we go really deep inside ourselves and we discover resilience inside ourselves that we never suspected was there previously. Mm -hmm. I often say that we don't know how strong we are until we face suffering. You know, suffering kind of breaks the surface of our being and it allows us to go deep inside ourselves and to draw on these deep reserves of resilience and strength. Now, I'm kind of in a paradoxical position myself when it comes to this. I've had a relatively easy life and it's not as if it's been free from all trauma and suffering. Of course, there's been some, but it's been relatively mild. But in my case, for what it's worth, uh, and because I do these interviews, I've been exposed over and over and over again for decades to discussions about spiritual awakening and higher consciousness mm -hmm. and paranormal events associated with that. I, and I think that's helped. I think that my philosophy has often been that we're going to grow one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a choice. We can grow joyfully or we can go, grow painfully. If, yeah. we, if we don't take the opportunity to grow joyfully, which I've been blessed to have in my life, mm -hmm. we're going to grow painfully. Yeah. Yeah, I'm certainly not saying that, that suffering and turmoil is the only route, route to awakening. That's not true. I mean, I, I haven't been through a great deal of turmoil and trauma in my own life, but I've still, you know, I've still been on a path of spiritual growth. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think in general, there are three ways in which spiritual awakening can occur. The first is when it's uh, entirely natural. You know, some people are just naturally spiritually awakened. They don't need to do anything. They don't need to meditate. They don't need to go through turmoil and trauma. You know, maybe, I, mean, I often think that childhood is a, is a kind of, you know, is a kind of natural, naturally spiritually awakened state. I'm not saying that children are enlightened, because in some children can be very narcissistic and very egocentric, but they have certain qualities of, of natural qualities of spiritual wakefulness about them, such as a you know a sense of presence, a sense of connection to the world, curiosity, curiosity openness, yeah. um, and, and and so on. Many many different qualities. So maybe some people retain those qualities as adults, and those qualities even become more intense. So they, they are naturally awakened people. And they, they sometimes become poets. They sometimes become artists or painters. Sometimes they become social activists. You know, they, they feel a, an intense desire to help their fellow human beings. And the second way in which spiritual awakening can occur is when it's gradual over many years or decades through following a, a path or a practice or a kind of uh, a mixture of different approaches. So that's when, it, when it's consciously cultivated. Well, not necessarily consciously. It can be accidentally cultivated too. If you, if you live a life of service, you know, if you're a community worker or a charity worker, even a nurse, um, then you will undergo spiritual awakening, spiritual development because of the, the service that your job involves. And also if, if you have a, a, a lifestyle which involves a lot of presence, you know, if you are working with animals, for example, you have to be present. If you're working with human beings, you have to be <laughs> present. So those, that natural presence can also give rise to spiritual development. 
So the third way in which spiritual awakening can occur is when it involves turmoil and trauma, which is what I've been investigating. So it's just one way. In terms of your background, you're a transpersonal psychologist. That's right. That's right. I've been involved in the field for 15 years now. And at the University of Leeds. Uh, yeah, Leeds Beckett University. Leeds Beckett. Yeah, yeah. This is now considered in the UK uh, an acceptable topic for students and uh, and academia. Yeah, to an extent. Yeah, we have a we have a transpersonal psychology section in the British Psychological Society. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the you know it's part of mainstream psychology, which is something we don't have in in the United States. The American Psychological Association rejected the a bid to open a transpersonal psychology division. So I heard. Yeah, that's a shame. Long ago, the argument was that. These transpersonal psychologists are, are really promoting religion, not psychology. Yeah, that, that argument hasn't really come up in, maybe because the UK is a more of a secular country mm -hmm. than the States. There isn't this sort of conflict. So There isn't so much of a conflict between religion and science or psychology. So, yeah, it's... Um, I mean, I've always thought that transpersonal psychology is just, um, you know, it's... it's it's just an extension of normal psychology. The only difference really is that normal psychology has an underlying assumption that human beings are pretty much complete psychologically as we are, and they're trying to free ourselves from psychological issues, from neuroses and uh, you know, um, psychological conditions. And you know, once you're free of psychological, psychological conditions, then you're pretty, pretty much ready to go. You, know, you, can, you can go ahead and live your life and have a career and be a happy, normal human being with fulfilling relationships. But transpersonal psychology suggests that that's not the case, that, human, that what we call normal, normality or normal human psychological functioning is actually limited and even aberrational. So we're trying to sort of heal the aberrational aspects of normal, the normal human psyche and create a more holistic and a more ful fulfilling um, mode of functioning. Well, I should think one of the real tricky aspects to the work you're doing is defining what is meant by a spiritual awakening. That's right. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do define it quite simply. You know, in, in my view, spiritual awakening is simply an expansion and an intensification of normal awareness. And I break that down into different areas. So there is an expansion of awareness in perceptual terms. So the world around us, around us becomes more real, more beautiful, more vivid, more fascinating. And there is also an expansion of awareness in intersubjective terms, so that we become more aware of, or more, we become more connected to other human beings and other living beings. We become more empathic, more compassionate, and more altruistic. There's also a, a, an expansion of awareness in subjective terms, because we, we become more aware of the, the depths and the fullness of our own being. We become able to explore our own being in greater depth. We become, we, we become aware of all, all of these inequalities that we were never previously aware of. And finally, there is an expansion of awareness in conceptual terms. So there is a, there is a wider vision of reality, a more global perspective, rather than an egocentric or sociocentric perspective. We sort of move beyond group identity. We move beyond national identity, any form of group identity. And really, the only thing we identify with is the human race as a whole. Well, as a parapsychologist, I'm particularly interested in the paranormal aspects of a, of a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. Do you address that? To an extent, yeah. They, when a person's awareness expands, they become more open to paranormal phenomena. I think in the normal human state, the ego is very boundaried. You know, it's kind of shut off and enclosed. And there's a sense of duality between us and the world. So when the ego has solid boundaries like that, you know, paranormal phenomena, phenomena just can't get in. So, but when the ego, when the boundaries become softer and more permeable, which they do in spiritual awakening, then you know, people become more creative, they have more spiritual experiences, and also um, 
they are more susceptible to paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that, that's, it is quite a common aspect of spiritual awakening. And sometimes I think it, it can kind of almost go in the reverse. A person will have a striking paranormal experience, which then triggers a spiritual awakening. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I guess any really intense experience can actually break down the barriers of the ego. And psychedelic experiences can have the same effect. So yeah, I think it's, I don't think you can really you can really separate spiritual awakening and, and you know psychic phenomena. Let's talk about psychedelic experience because I think there's an attitude in the culture at large that people use these recreational drugs and they have parties and uh, listen to music or dance all night long, but it doesn't necessarily change them as people. They're still the same person afterwards. Mm, that can be the case. I, I think you need to, you know, approach psych psychedelics with the right intention. You know, if you take psychedelics from a hedonistic perspective, then, you know, it's, they're probably not so likely to give rise to, you know, an awakening experience or a spiritual experience. But if you approach them, you know, with a more spiritual, sacred perspective, if you create the right conditions, mm -hmm. then they, they can create that opening that can give rise to spiritual experiences. Timothy Leary used to say it's the set and the setting. Yeah, that's right. And, and they can. They can break down the, the boundaries of the ego and give you access to this wider reality. Mm -hmm. I like the term peak experience. Obviously, we got Maslow's term peak experience, right. but also the term peak experience as in peeking into a wider reality. So I think psychedelics can, can do that. And once you've seen the wider reality, everything changes. You, you can't really go back to your kind of narrow, limited perspective on reality. You know that there is more. And I think a lot of people, once they've seen that wider reality, then they become involved in spiritual, spiritual practices. They know intuitively that the way to cultivate a permanent awareness of this wider reality mm -hmm. is through spiritual practice. Now, I don't necessarily think that regu regularly taking psychedelics will give you permanent access to that wider reality. I think, you know, it's more productive to follow a path of spiritual practice once you've seen, once psychedelics have given you that glimpse. When you use the phrase wider reality, I think what you're referring to is maybe what Jung would call the self with a big capital S. Yeah, yeah. Something much larger than, than the ego. And I think once you transcend the ego, then the world becomes a completely different place. You know, you are actually aware of realities which are hidden from the normal ego. You know, the world becomes a completely different place in, in perceptual terms. I think normally human beings see the world through a veil of familiarity. They're there, but they're not really there because they're inside their ego. They're living their, you know, their reality is being filtered through their thoughts. Mm -hmm. There's all this kind of conceptual stuff in their minds, which is preventing them seeing the world as it really is. But when the veil of familiarity fades away, it's like, wow, this is reality. And it's a, it's a different reality. It's incredibly beautiful. It's fascinating. It's exhilarating. And I think when you, when you live within the confines of the ego, life becomes dull. You know, you, it becomes dissatisfying, very mundane. But then, you know, maybe you meditate, you take psychedelics, you have a a traumatic episode which triggers a spiritual awakening and then the world is so beautiful and so fascinating and real and you know you are never bored again you are never lonely again because you are ne you are never isolated you're you're always connected to the world so all of those sort of psychological all of those negative psychological states such as boredom or loneliness or dis dissatisfaction and frustration all of those fade away I mean, in conventional terms, people talk about the rat race. Mm -hmm. You're struggling to make a living. You want to get what you can for yourself and for your family. And it's a never-ending cycle. That's right. Yeah. But um, once people undergo awakening, they, they're not really interested in accumulating things anymore. They're not really interested in racing along with the, the other rats, so to speak. They're interested in contributing, not accumulating. Mm -hmm. So there's a shift from, um, you know, wanting to take from the world mm 
to wanting to give to the world, a shift, a really, a really sudden and strong, powerful shift in orientation. So life becomes much more fulfilling, you know, and it's, it's so fulfilling to, to give to the world, to, to be altruistic, to be kind, to ele- try to alleviate people's suffering, to try to contribute to the human race's development. So people could become more fulfilled as a result of that. I think when it comes to spiritual practice, sort of the, the bedrock is typically one form or another of what you could call or classify as meditation. Yeah. But meditation can be quite wide-ranging. Now, I often, I often think that um, activities like swimming or running, um, they can be quite meditative. Mm-hmm. People sometimes say to me, oh, you know, I'd like to meditate, but I find it really difficult. You know, once I close my eyes, my, my thoughts seem to go out of control. My mind gets really busy. So I say to them, well, you know, don't meditate then. Just, just for now, maybe first of all, you should just go running or go swimming. And while you're running or swimming, just be aware of your body and be aware of your surroundings. And it'll take you out of your mind and bring your attention into your body. So once people grow used to, you know, being taken out of their minds and being attentive to their bodies, being one with their bodies, then maybe they develop a a certain degree of inner stability, a certain degree of inwardness, Mm -hmm. and then they become able to meditate in, you know, in a traditional sense. Do you follow a spiritual practice yourself? I have over the years, yeah. I I meditate regularly. I have different meditative practices. Mm -hmm. I used to follow a a spiritual teacher in Manchester, in the UK. Um, He died a few years ago, but I still attend some of the the group's meetings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've been on a a path of spiritual development for many years. I gather from what you're saying that you're somewhat eclectic. Yeah, that's right. I don't follow follow any specific path. Um, You know, at at, at certain times in the past, I thought, "Mm, maybe maybe, maybe I should uh, become a Buddhist or maybe I should become a you know, a Hindu adept. But it doesn't seem authentic for me to, to, know, to, to focus on one specific path. I see myself as more wide-ranging and, you know, and, you know I, I feel as though I'm creating my own path. It strikes me more and more people are doing that these days. I, I recall years ago the advice was uh, you should follow a spiritual path, whatever it is, typically the one you might be born into, mm-hmm. as, as a matter of fact, because it's culturally compatible. Uh, but you should stick with that path. You shouldn't kind of dabble around and uh, treat it as a smorgasbord that you can sample from. Yeah. Uh, but I, I kind of disagree with that. I think that we are the inheritors of world spiritual traditions, and it, it's mm. good to have a feeling for all of them. I agree. I can see benefits in following a, or being a part of a specific tradition, because you know, if you do go through a spiritual awakening, then you don't have to struggle to understand it. You have a framework to make sense of it. You also have the support of other people who follow the same path. So, but if you are on your own without a path, that can sometimes be a bit tricky. You know, I, I found in my research that a lot of people would go through spiritual awakenings in the midst of trauma and they wouldn't understand what happened to them because they didn't have a background in spirituality. A lot of times they were just, you know, so-called ordinary people, you know, in the midst of everyday life. So they undergo this sudden shift and they feel great. They feel connected to everything. They feel a deep sense of inner well-being, a deep sense of appreciation of every aspect of their lives. But sometimes it was overlaid by a a feeling of confusion, you know, have I gone mad? Is this, is this insanity? You know? <laughs> Has somebody been putting psychedelics in my water supply? And the people around them would not understand them either. They would think, wow, wow, what's happened to you? Why, why, is, why are you so different? You, you've gone crazy. So they, they, they needed really a framework to make sense of it. And eventually they always do make sense of it, but it can take a while before they, it's usually a question of gravitating towards, you know, spiritual books or spiritual groups. And they read a spiritual book like maybe the power of now, and they think, wow, yeah, this is what's happened to me, so I'm not crazy after all, you know. <laughs> I'm the opposite of crazy. So, but yeah, but if you're in a tradition, then you don't really have that problem because you, you have a, a ready-made framework. But I agree, I think it, it's much preferable to, you know, to survey the different traditions and the different practices and, 
choose the ones which suit your own personality. Well, am amongst other things, it eliminates the problem. I, I guess I would identify it as tribalism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, believing that your path is superior to others. That's always a danger of spiritual practice. And, um, yeah, and, and, and the, the, guru can, the, the guru tradition can also be problematic. You know, there are many cases of um, gurus who've become corrupt and exploited their followers. So, you know, at least if you follow your own path, then you're free of the, the guru syndrome, as I call it. Well, would you have a good definition when we talk about wider self? What, how, how would you define that? I would define it as a, a self that has transcended separation. I think a lot of, a lot of uh, issues in human behavior and in human experience stem from the sense of separation, the feeling that you are enclosed within your body and your mind and the world is out there. You're trapped in here, looking out at a world which is out there on the other side. And that, that creates a fundamental sense of isolation. And that sense of isolation leads to a general feeling of unease and anxiety. And I think that's the root of the human desire to accumulate, the human desire to accumulate power and wealth and so forth. I think it stems from this fundamental sense of separation. But once you transcend separation and you develop a sense of connection to other people, to other living beings, to the world in general, to nature, then all of those issues fade away. You know, you don't feel the same urge to accumulate. You don't feel the same, uh, the same sense of unease. You feel a, you know, you feel a, a state of graceful connection with all other things. And a lot of spiritual teachers say that the sense of separation is illusory. And I agree. So once you transcend separation, then the self is everything. You know, you're not, you're not an individual self. The self is in everything. You are part of everything. Well, that is put beautifully. I tend to agree wholeheartedly. You hear this all the time in the mystical literature, all is one. Mm, mm. Or the famous joke of the Dalai Lama going to a baseball game and ordering a hot dog, and he says, make me one with everything. <laughs> That's true. I think it, it goes right down to the essence of our beings. I mean, what is the essence of, of being human? The essence of being human is consciousness. You know, we have we have a fundamental consciousness, which um, you know, which we share with all other things. I think our own being has its source in a, a universal consciousness, and all other living beings have their being in, in their, their source in that fundamental consciousness. And that's why mystical experiences always feature a sense of oneness, because oneness is fundamental. You know, it's you're just tapping into the fundamental reality of things. By virtue of the very fact that we exist at all. Yeah, that's right, yeah. We emerge from, you know, the source of pure consciousness. I'm in total agreement with you there, and I talk about this a lot on this particular YouTube channel, but I always hear from viewers who say, wait a second here, you are not one with God, you are still separate, uh, and uh, it's egotistical, it's arrogant to think otherwise. You're really just uh, falling into another trap. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think oneness is the, is the essence of all things. You know? mm -hmm. I think the universe began with pure consciousness, mm -hmm. I have, I have a philosophical approach which I call panspiritism mm -hmm. as opposed to panpsychism. And the, the idea of panspiritism is that spirit or fundamental consciousness, as I call it, is everywhere. You know, it's, it pervades the air around us. It pervades all physical things. It pervades all living things. And fundamental consciousness was the pure, the original state before the universe began. The universe emerged from pure consciousness. And universal consciousness is canalized into our own being. You know, I think that the function of the brain is not to produce consciousness, but is to transmit, to receive and transmit consciousness into our own being. So in that sense, we are all channels of fundamental consciousness, and we are all interconnected. And 
yet you will hear from people who conventionally will say, no, we live in a world of good and evil, and you should move towards the good and away from the evil. You should shun evil. You should reject evil. You should hate evil. You should fight evil. You should defeat evil. Yeah, you should, but you need to consider where does evil arise? Mm -hmm. Where does evil come from? I don't think evil is in, it's not an innate quality of the world or of human beings. Evil is an aberration which stems from separation. Evil stems from disconnection. If you think about the most evil people, they are the most disconnected people. They are the people who are completely trapped within their own egos. Therefore, they cannot empathize with other people. You know, they, they are completely free to inflict suffering on other people because they can't, they can't sense other people's suffering. They can't behave altruistically because they are completely self-centered. They are completely trapped mm -hmm. inside themselves. So goodness arises from connection. You know, when we feel connected to other people, we become capable of empathy, uh, compassion, which gives rise to altruistic behavior. So the, you know, the, the human development is largely about transcending separation, which gives rise to evil, and moving towards connection, which gives rise to goodness. There's a paradox in there because it means being connected with the very people who are separate. Yeah. You can empathize with, you know, somebody may be a psychopath. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be the most evil person um, in the world. But it doesn't mean that you cannot empathize with them. People become disconnected for usually due to traumatic childhood experiences, a lack of, uh, a lack of t attention and affection or a, a long period of abuse during childhood. So, I mean, you don't have to condone their behavior, but you can still empathize with them to an extent, even though they may be evil beings. Back to our original premise that, that trauma can trigger a, an opening. I, I'm inclined to think that when people are very much caught up in, in their separateness, that uh, that's when it often takes a traumatic event for them to break out of it. That's true, yeah. And, and in some ways, you know, I mean, I think some people are so separate that no amount of trauma can break down their separateness. You know, they are completely enclosed. Their, their ego boundaries are so solid that almost nothing can break through. And I think that's true of the most disconnected, the most psychopathic people. It's well known that psychopaths, you know, pretty much cannot be healed. They're just so disconnected that nothing can break through. But, you know, moving further away from that level of disconnection, then certainly, yeah, a powerful traumatic experience can break down the, the solid barriers of the ego and create a wider perspective, a wider sense of self. Which, and then a person becomes capable of empathy and compassion and altruism. I've certainly spoken with people who have suffered terrible traumas in, in their life. One fellow who, whom I know is W. Mitchell. He's a world-renowned speaker, but the, the man has had accidents, motorcycle accidents, aviation accidents, to the extent where he's confined to a wheelchair, his fingers have been burned off. But if you talk to him, he would tell you that because of the lessons he learned in that process, if he had to do it all over again, he would. Right. Yeah, but it goes back to what we were saying before, that um, going through turmoil and suffering deepens you. You know, it breaks the surface of your being and it draws out inner strength that you were never aware of before. I, I, I often say that human beings underestimate themselves because we, we, we imagine situations and we think, mm, maybe I'm not sure if I'll be able to cope with that. You know, maybe... Maybe a bit tricky, that situation. But when it comes down to it, when we face crises and challenges, almost always we find the reserves to cope with them and to transcend the challenges. I, I've, I found that through um, doing research about people in the Soviet gulags who are living in, in incredibly deprived conditions. A lot of people talked about this strange soul power that would emerge inside them when they were hungry and desperate and when the temperature was minus 30 degrees they would find this strange inner radiance which would just fill their whole bodies and give them new energy and strength. A bit like, you know, in Hindu philosophy, they talk about the cities. Mm -hmm. It was a bit like they were gain gaining access to the cities. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to all crises and all challenges. You know, when we are tested, we find the reserves to cope 
and to transcend the situation. Well, it strikes me, Steve, that the human race as a whole is being tested now. Things are happening not just at the individual level. We're, we're dealing with global pandemics. We're dealing with global pollution. We're dealing with uh, global climate change and uh, the prospect of global nuclear war, e even that uh, humanity is sort of on the brink. We now have maybe for the first time in human history the potential to destroy ourselves. And, right, yeah. and, and so that at some kind of a collective level, we are potentially at the precipice of a spiritual awakening mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the masses of humanity. I think you could compare it to a person who is diagnosed with cancer. They have to face the, the prospect of imminent death. And it often has a, a very sudden awakening effect on people. Suddenly, they realize that life is temporary, life is precious. Suddenly, suddenly they become aware of the beauty of everything around them. The veil of familiarity suddenly falls away and think, wow, the world is so beautiful and life is so precious. But it often takes that encounter with imminent death to bring that about. So I think, as you say, as a species, we're, we are in a similar predicament. We are facing imminent death. And I think it is having an awakening effect. If you look at the last 20 years or so, I think probably interest in spirituality is one of the most prevalent, you know, most um, significant, significant cultural trends. It's probably increasing exponentially. And there's also research showing that spiritual experiences are becoming more common. Uh, certainly, you know, in surveys where people are asked, have you ever had a spiritual experience or a mystical experience of oneness with nature? More people, many more people answer yes than they did 30, 40 years ago. And in my research, I find it, I'm constantly amazed by the number of people who undergo these spontaneous spiritual awakenings in the midst of turmoil. It's almost as if there's a latent higher self which is waiting to be born, not just in individuals, but in the, humans, in the human race as a whole. It's almost as if the next level of our evolution is already established and it's slowly emerging. Just like, you know, when the, the water level rises, you know, water is it kind of manifests itself in different ways. Sea level rises, there's more rivers uh, higher and so forth. It's like the kind of, the, in the same way, spirituality is increasing its momentum is, and is manifesting itself in, in lots of different ways. And as you say, I think that is largely because of the, you know, the collective crises we are undergoing. It's tricky to me. I, I see that if we look back historically in the 20th century, we had mass revolutions, mass starvations. We had holocausts. We, we, we have had incredible traumas in the previous century. Some of them mm -hmm. are kind of leaking into the current century. And, and one wonders, are we going to make it? Yeah, it's, um, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be a close call, I think, because I think there is, a, there is definitely a wave of spiritual awakening manifesting itself. But at the same time, there are these processes of emotion which are leading us towards catastrophe. Cataclysmic events are already occurring. So it's going to be a close call. It's, it's a question of whether the wave of spiritual awakening can manifest itself strongly enough to overcome the negative events. I, I am optimistic. You know, you also need to look at the long-term future as well. You know, even if there are cataclysms in the, in the next few decades, I'm sure the human race will survive in some form and eventually a new form of human awareness will emerge in a, diff in a different way. But it's, you know, it's, it's, we live in very exciting times. We do indeed. Well, Steve Taylor, this has been a delightful conversation, a very profound one, in my opinion. I'm thrilled to be able to share it with our viewers. I recommend your book very highly to our viewers to uh, think that you are in a position where a university will uh, sponsor you to study spiritual awakening itself is very encouraging. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jeff. Great to speak to you. Thank you for being with me, Steve. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.